thanks for this opportunity to come before you. I'm, again, I didn't share while we were having testimonies, but I would have shared. I, just to get started, indulge me for a moment, but I just want to say I'm very thankful for this church. Um, coming here, I didn't know what was going to happen. We came from a place where we, we were heavily involved, and it was not a great thing to have to leave, but we, we felt we had to at the time, and uh, finding this place has been a real godsend, a real blessing, and um, I'm humbled by how Mark's taken me in and really been become a mentor to me, and Brad's become a brother that I've been working with and really appreciate that. It's been encouraging. So me and my wife both appreciate it. She would never tell you because she's emotional. And so she would never get up and tell you that, but I thought I would tell it on behalf of both of us. So we're very thankful for that. So I'm just going to open with prayer before we start. You want to bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come again in your house to worship you in this holy ground where you are present with us, dear Lord, and we're so thankful for that, and we're so humbled by that, and uh, we don't take it lightly, dear Lord. We are on holy ground, and uh, let us worship you and uh, just uh, give you honor and praise for all that we do within this place, dear Lord. And as we open up the word, dear Lord, I just pray personally that you would just take this broken vessel of clay that comes cracked, but also comes willing to serve and willing to do your will. And I just pray to the Lord you would take it and mold it and make something beautiful of it because that's what you do with us. You take us, no matter what, our, what the offering is, you take it and make something beautiful from it. As long as we're willing, you don't ask for ability, but you ask for availability. And we're so thankful for that, dear Lord. So again, just be with us this time and help us just to uh, learn more of what it is you want for us from your word because it's the words of life. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. So another indulgence of mine is I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what Pastor Mark was doing. Uh, he finished his uh, Sermon on the Mount series just uh, two weeks ago or a week or so ago. Um, and this message was given to me by God even before that. So I'm not really cheating or I'm not really, you know, I just, it, it, was, it was given to me before that. So it's just kind of cool. And I knew after when Mark asked me, it was like, okay, this is definitely God ordained because it fits well with what Mark had been, Pastor Mark had been preaching. So if you want to turn with me, the, the passage I'll be looking at is the few verses right after the Sermon on the Mount, again, found in Matthew chapter 5, and it's verses 13 through 16 that I want to focus on tonight. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and I'm reading from the American Standard Version, just so you know, I like to tell people what I'm reading from because it might be a little different than what you're reading from. So, Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 read, You are the salt of the earth, but as salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see you, your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. And may that's what we do here tonight. So as you can see, my passage is basically focusing on the salt and light. And as I say, this piggybacks off of what Mark was saying and what we just went through in the Beatitudes. Um, so I just want to take the time that I have tonight just to expound on those two central things, the, the salt and the light. This is what we're called to be. So we see in verse 13, it says, what does it mean, we're, we're to be salt, but sometimes we, the Bible says things and we're wondering, what does it mean to be salt? And I find it very interesting that they use that word, like salt. What, what is salt? It sounds weird. In today's world, salt is bad. You know, don't eat salt. It's bad for you. It's, you know, don't eat it. Stay away. But in biblical times, it was absolutely vital and important. Because back then, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have any means. They didn't have ice at the corner store. All they had was salt to keep their meat and what's, pres what's vital to them for survival, their food. All they had was salt to keep that meat good and keep it from going bad. So at that time, salt was, and it was also traded almost like money as well. If you had salt, you basically were rich. You had, lot, like, people would give you things for salt because it was such a high in demand and high commodity to have at the time. So salt was very, very important at the time. So I want to just look at what salt means, being salt in biblical and what Jesus was getting at here. And for it, I, I came up, there was, I found a list that had 40 for what, what salt does and 40 for what light does. 
I'm not going to go through all 80, don't worry. That would take forever, so I'm not going to do that to you. But I, I took four from each, four of the main ones that I think really have a purpose for us here tonight. So first, salt adds taste. That's what we use salt for. When we sit down at the supper table, we grab the salt shaker and we put salt on our food because we want it to have taste. And I think that applies to us in an important way because we are God's ambassadors. We are, we are, we are followers of Jesus Christ, and we need to be salty. And what I mean by that is we need to have and live in such a way that people see us and want to be, they're drawn to us. They want, they, we're, we were to be so different from others that they wonder, what's, what do they have? What's going on in that person's life that makes them a certain way, whether it be their kindness, their generosity, their love, their passion, their, their grace, graciousness, whatever it may be. And that's what is kind of what Christ was getting at. We're to be salty. We're to let that shine through in, in tangible, meaningful ways. And if you, uh, I, in Psalm 34, verses 7 through 9, it says, Psalm 37, verses four th- 7 to 9, it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So as you can see, that, that we are to be taste and see. The tasting, we're asked to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what we are. We, we, we are to be that to people. We are his hands and feet. You've heard that saying. We are to be God's hands and feet in this world today. So the first aspect, like I say, I just, we need to be tasty. And that just to be something someone's going to want to be drawn to, be, be, we, they'll gravitate towards us because we're, we're giving off something that's appealing. The second thing in terms of salt is it creates a thirst and stimulates hunger. If, you, if you've ate like, a, say if you ate a really salty bag of chips, you want something to drink right away. You're, you're thirsty. You need something. So you go for the drink. You go for the whatever. And that's the thing we need to be as well. We have... We, we have our lives and we've lived our lives and we, each of us has a different story. And we have a testimony for what, that, what God has done for us. And that's kind of what we need to do with this. We need to share our lives with people. We need to speak of what God has done for us and how good God has been to us. And that will hopefully, as we speak into somebody's life with our story, because that's what it is to be a witness, to speak into somebody's life what God has done for you, it'll stimulate something within them. It'll give them a hunger and a thirst and in Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So as we season our speak, as we, as we talk to people, what it means is we try to be, not, not that we have eloquent, fancy, crazy like words to say, because some, sometimes we don't, but we just need to speak in such a way that shows God's love and compassion that, he has given to us and shown to us, is we show that to other people. It'll, again, it will help them, and they'll, they'll say, I want more of that. I, I need what they have, and that's what we offer to them. We offer them a reason for the goodness that God has been to us. We offer a, a story, a testimony, and we all have one, so we need to offer that into people's lives. Um, the third aspect of salt is it's a healing agent. And each of us has a, probably could give testimonies. Like, we all have a testimony to give. And we've all been healed of certain different things, spiritually, physically, whatever it may be. I know for me, personally, I had a debilitating chronic disease. And it was basically called the suicide disease because it was a high suicide rate within this disease. I battled it for, like, over 12 years. Just pain every day. Sometimes I couldn't eat, so I couldn't sleep, I couldn't talk at times. There'd be days that I couldn't even talk because of this, this chronic illness I had. But I, through the grace of God, came to the place where the, the um, medication wasn't working anymore, basically. I was, on, I was on meds that basically just knocked me out. I couldn't even, I wasn't even existing at the time. But through the grace of God, a surgeon came along and said that I can operate on you. And she was a Christian woman, so it was amazing. And I knew from that point it was, it was God-given, God-ordained. And I haven't had a, I, I, went through day, I went through almost every day in pain. I haven't had a pain in over three years. And I give that all the glory to God because she said that it might, you know, there's a chance it might not work. But I've been three over, 
three, close to in my fourth year of pain-free. So again, we've all been healed. We've all had stories where God has been so gracious to us, so kind, so merciful in times of trouble, whether, again, whether it be a physical healing of a sickness or just a, he's all healed our hearts. He's all healed our hearts from sin in the work on the cross as we looked at the table and the emblems of his uh, dying and bleeding for us on the cross. He's all healed us spiritually. So we have that story to tell and speak into people's lives because there's hurt around us, all around us. Even us Christians, we hurt, we pain, we're in agony, and we need to be healed daily of things that have gone on. So, And we, as God's children and followers of Christ, have the ability to speak into people's lives and heal and help them with those hurts and those pains. So we need to do that. Uh, the fourth thing on salt is, is that it is, is preservative, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, that it was used to keep their, their food good because if they ate bad food, they'd be sick, and some sickness you can get from meat would kill you in those days. Nowadays, we have medicines, but if they didn't keep their meat well-preserved, it could literally kill them, so it was very, very important. And as we, and again, Christ did not use these words purposely. He used them purposely, I mean, And the reason why, because we can be that preservative. We have God's word, and we are walking representations of that word. And we can speak into people's lives with this word and help them, whatever they may be going through. They're going through a lot. I mean, you know what you've gone through, and you know what you are going through. And the person next to you is no different. On the outside, we look different, but on the inside, we are the same. We all have a heart that hurts and longs and is in pain sometimes. And so we need to be that 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 agent of God's light and love into people's lives and again help preserve them and combat that darkness that's all around because you know the times it's it's there we can't get her out of it um so if uh the next verse I just wanted to look at quickly that kind of shoots on that is found in John chapter 17 verses 14 and 15 and it reads I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So that's what he's saying here. He's saying that, yes, we are not of the world, but he has not taken us out of the world at the same time. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. But the key is we are to be in the world. We need to be something... To the, the generation that we're around, the society that we're in, we need to be an agent of just light and, and salt and preservative and helping them because we know what people are going through, as I say. They're combating, we know even as Christians that we are not against just flesh and blood. We are against principalities of darkness around us. We, if we feel it as Christians, as blood-bought sinners of Christ, then what is someone who doesn't know Christ going through? Just think about that. Just grasp your head around that. What are they going through? What is their struggle? How badly are they hurting? If we ourselves can hurt like that sometimes. Um, so as I say, I, we, we need to grasp that concept that we are the salt of the earth. And that's where they, that saying comes. They're salt of the earth people. They're, they're worth their weight in salt. Like there's, there's all kinds of sayings that go with salt. And a lot of that comes from the biblical text. We get those sayings from the biblical text. So as I've done with salt, I want to take a look at light, um, because again, it's salt and light in this passage. Um, The Bible says that God is light, and what that means intellectually, it means that he is the knowledge, that God's knowledge is the light. What it means also in terms of morally, it means that he's the holiness, God's light is the holiness of God. And physically, what it means is that the glory, God's glory is the light, and what it means for us, what, it, what does it mean to be light again? Sometimes we, the Bible says, what, be this, be that, do this, do that. But what does it really mean? How do we really apply that to our lives? So again, I want to look at four attributes of light. And the first one I want to just point out is, is light is used to bring warmth. And back in the day, not so much today, we don't necessarily use light as warmth. But back in biblical times, back in the old days, they actually used light as warmth. They lit candles, they lit you know, lamps. They lit these things and they all huddle around little candles sometimes just to get warm off that little light. So again, light was very important back in those days, even like a flame, like a light's still important today, but back then there was a certain specialness to like a light lighted candle or a lighted lamp because sometimes that's only only warmth some families had was that little little lamp, that little light. Um, 
And we have that light within us, within us. And we're, we have an amazing, like I said before, we have an amazing testimony full of just um, God's grace and love. And we, we can warm people's hearts with that. We can warm people's just, they're, like I say, they're hurting, they're, need, they're in need. And we have that light of God's love that you've been, it's been spoken to you when you've been down and out. I don't know who, everyone here has somebody that spoke into your lives and helped you become a follower of Jesus Christ. And that was just a, such a great, I know for me personally, it was, a, it was a great act of love and compassion when someone spoke into my life. And it did, it warms your heart. And that's what we can be. We can be that warmth to people. Um, also, the second thing that light does is it clarifies Light also can be used to bring the answers to people's questions. Sometimes people, we, even as Christians, we wonder what, we, we question, we're, we have doubts, we have fears, we don't understand. But just imagine what the person next to you that maybe doesn't know God and has questions and fears and anxieties and, and worries and stuff. And, and we know what the power of God's word and the power of Christ in our lives and the Holy Spirit does for us. And we have that to offer to them. We can give them clarity in their life. We can give them a sense of uh, understanding and a sense of peace about things because we have what everybody needs. It's, it's not a big, huge, fancy formula. We just have the love of God within our hearts to offer into people's lives. And that's the one thing that brings true clarity. Nothing else truly does because at the end of the day, all you really have is Christ and his love and his light for you. And we need to offer that to other people so they can come to grips with that deep longing in their hearts because I don't know if you've heard it said Everybody has a God-shaped hole in their hearts. It was a popular saying back, if, and it still is. I mean, we have this God-shaped hole, everybody. God's created us to worship him and to love him and to be his followers. So we can offer that into their lives, and we need to, and we must. Um, uh, Ephesians 5.13 kind of speaks to this. Ephesians 5.13 says, in verses 14, it says, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and he rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So again, we need to just, again, just throw that love and that, that just whatever you have to offer. You each have something to offer. Sometimes we don't think we do, but we do. We have a story that Christ has given us. God has given us and planted it in us. The third thing that light does is it illuminates, and that's one of the most obvious ones, of course. You go into your house, it's dark, you flick a switch, there's light. It, guide, it, it opens up the darkness, it gives you light, it gives you the means to be able to walk in and not fall, not trip, not whatever. And that's what we have spiritually. We have a light that we can shine into the darkness and help people find their way. I mean, we're, they're law. I mean, just again, just imagine that where we were before we found Christ. So there's so many people around us that need that. And we have so many people that need us to speak into their life and turn the light on. Sometimes people are in so much darkness, they have no concept of what to do, how to turn. I know when I was found my, that longing in their heart, you just know you need something more than what you've done or what you've tried. But you don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. It's like, what, what do I do? How do I get rid of this darkness that's encompassing me? And luckily, as I said, somebody came along and said, here, Troy, I know the light, I know the way, and I'm going to help you see that. And they helped turn the light on for me. And that's, again, what Christ was saying here. Again, these words are not used flippantly. They're used for a purpose and a reason. And it was for us to be what he's saying to be. And that is to illuminate in people's lives. Um, if you want to check um, in Book of Acts, chapter 26, uh, verses 16 through 18, kind of speaks a little bit about this. So Acts 26, verses 16 to 18, it says, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for the purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan of God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So as we see, we're that, we're that, we have that ability, we have that, that chance to speak that into people's lives and to help them come out of the darkness and into the light. Um, fourthly, light provides pathways and guides. And back in the day, again, it was more important. 
that little spark of light. They didn't have flashlights. They didn't have cell phones with flashlight apps. All they had was sometimes little candles and little, little things. And it was very important for them, like the shepherds out in the field had torches. The, the people that walk in about their house, they had to have a little light that guided their way and opened up the pathways for them. So it's very important that, and that's the, spiritually, again, it all comes back to that, that we have this light within us that shines. And we need to, sometimes we, like, like the passage said earlier, sometimes we put it under a bushel. We don't put it up on the lampstand to let it shine. And we need to shine that because there are people that are lost. And we need to speak into their lives God's love and God's compassion and God's heart for them in order for them to see clearly the path for them and see clearly how we can guide them and support them and whatever it may be. Because we've all gone through it. We've all been through it. We've all been through times of loss and loneliness. And even as Christians, we can have periods in our lives where we're just, what's going on, God? If you read the Psalms, it's like, God, where am I? What's going on? Where are you in this? What do I need to do? So we need to even, as Christian brothers and sisters in Christ, come up alongside one another and say, hey, I, I've been through what you're going through. I've walked those waters. I've been in that darkness, and I've been shown the way out. Let me come alongside you and help you out. So we need to have that light in, within us and allow, allow it to shine through and allow people to understand that we are there for them. And John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And again, here we see that these words are not used flippantly. They're not used by mistake. Every, every dot, every letter, every comma, everything is for a purpose and a reason within these book. And again, light is such a vital aspect of that. So as we can see as followers of Christ, we Christians are called to be salt and light. Each and every believer here today is both salt and light. Now, some say, and this is where the rest of the, the Beatitudes come in. Some people say, what can I do? What do I have to offer? The one thing the enemy does, and I know he does it to me, and I know if he's doing it to me, he's doing it to you too. He feeds off your insecurities. He feeds off your fears, and he feeds off your, your lack of confidence in yourself. He says, like they did in the garden, like the snake said, you know, God didn't really mean that. And that's what the enemy does today. He says, you know, you're too weak. You're too meek. You're too, you're too whatever. You can't do anything for God. You know, just go under the rock and stay there because you have nothing to offer. And that's what the enemy does. The enemy does that. He says you're too weak. He says you're too small. You're too lowly. But that is exactly where God wants us to be. He, that Sermon on the Mount was basically Jesus preparing the people because he knew he was going to the cross. The Sermon on the Mount was given as a preparation for his people to be what he wanted them to be in this world today. So that's why he gave that. And it's not, he didn't say, you know, you're great, you're fantastic, you, you got it all figured out, you're this, 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 and that. He said, no, you are meek, you are down, you are mournful, you are down in spirit, you're heavy, you're whatever. But that's the kind of people God uses. That's the kind of people that God wants to use. You look throughout the whole scriptures. I mean, you've got people like David stood up against Goliath. And everybody said, yeah, little David, what's he got? To, what can he do? But what did David do? He took what God gave him. It, to most people, like a little rock and a sling, what's that going to do? But David said, no, okay, God, this is what you want me to do. I'll trust in your sling, and I'll trust in this little rock you gave me. Flung it at the giant, the giant dead. So that's what he wants to do with us. He knows we're weak. He knows we're, we're down sometimes. He knows, but that's the kind of people, like I say, he wants to use and he will use. And again, I, there's, I mean, there's tons of examples in the scriptures what God has used weak. I mean, Moses thought he had nothing to say and couldn't offer anything, but look what he did. I mean, there's so many examples over and over and over again of people that just did amazing things out of weakness, out of whatever. They did amazing things. And if you'll indulge with me, I do want to read uh, the Beatitudes. I know we've been through them, but I think it's uh, vital just to hear them again. God's Word's always relevant. God's Word's always speaking new every day. His mercies are new every morning. So again, I just want to speak to them. The Beatitudes are, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, as they shall be com comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall have received mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, you falsely on your account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But again, the verse I used tonight. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled upon in, under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see you in your good works and give glory to the God, the Father, who art in heaven. And again, I just wanted to repeat those words because, again, very prevalent and very important. So here I ask this, this evening, I just want to say, you know, if you are poor in spirit, if you're, wherever you are in your life right now, I mean, some of us, thankfully, we're on a mountaintop and everything's just going just swimmingly and we're just praise God and please praise God for that because we know that's not always the case. But some of us, are in, some people are, might be in the deepest of valleys that we just don't see no way out. But again, that's where God wants to use you. If you're there, whether it be on the mountain or in the valley, you are salt and light where you are today. If you're mourning, I mean, I've lost my mother. I mean, it was 21, 22 years ago now, I think it was. Her birthday was just a while ago. She would have been 76. She died when she was uh, 50, 55. I miss her more today than I did then. I, I still mourn her death because she was my life. She was my everything. She was my best friend, my biggest support, my biggest... But because of her and her life and her coming to God through her cancer and her death, I became a Christian. So, and she's going to be there. I'll see, I don't, I mean, yes, I'm missing her now, but I've got her for eternity. Praise God for that. So this is the thing. It doesn't matter. Like, God can take the morning and make something beautiful out of it. He can take the morning and make something amazing out of it. So we need to be thankful, and, and that's why we need to be the salt and life in the earth. Because people are in mourning. People have lost. And we have comfort for them. We have peace for them. We can offer what they need. If you're hunger and thirst for God, and sometimes we go through lives in our lives and sometimes we're just there, you know what I mean? We're in the pocket of our Christian life. We just, it's swimming along, it's smooth, everything's just going great. But then there's those times where it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know. Like I, this summer, before summer started, Pastor Mark asked me one time after church, how you doing? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 he probably was looking, like a lot of times we give the pad answer, you know what I mean? Like, oh great, hey, we put on our smiling faces and our great Sunday best and we're just, everything's super. But no, that day, I was just like, what's going on? I don't know what my future holds. I don't know what's happening. I would just started here, and I was wanting to get involved. And he asked me after church, like, how is things going? I'm like, I don't know. I'm a mixed mash of just doubts and fears, concerns. But I also said it was a good place, too, because that's where, that's, again, where God can say, hey, I've got you right where I want you. He's got you. I got my finger on you. I'm going to shake you. I'm going to mold you, but I'm going to make you in something great. And that's what he's doing. I'm thankful that... Like, again, I can't say enough how thankful I am for this man for what he did for me that day and what he's continuing to do for me. It's, it's again, I'm not going to say too much because I might get emotional too because I tend to do that. But like I say, that's the thing. We need, we need like, he, what he did for me and what Brad's done for me and done for and the, the ladies taking Tanya into their, their Bible study group, that's what we need to do to other people. It's so important to us and how it has it made us feel. So let us do it. No matter where we're at, let us speak into those things because no matter where we're at, we can still be that salt and light to people at the time. And we've been showed mercy. We've been showed lots of mercy. God, I, I, I think to myself, why did he ever choose me? Why, why, did, why does what he did on the cross apply to my life? It's such a great testimony of his mercy, his love, and his grace that someone like me could be sanctified and, and being glorified eventually when I see him face to face. But that's still a humbling thing to me. And please never use that, lose that humbleness feeling of what God has done for us because it's, it's amazing. It's unfathomable. It's ununderstandable. But for some odd reason, he's applied it to us. And just, it's amazing. So just, we all have a story. I've shared a little bit of my personal story. And hopefully in days come, I'll be able to share. I know I've been asked to share my testimony with the, this week. Actually, I've been asked to share my testimony with the little ones and the teenagers. So it's going to be, it's going to be a week of testimony. So, 
But I, I, it, but God's given, like, like I say, God's given us each problems. Like I was bullied to the point where I had to quit school because the doctor said, if you do not quit school, you will have a nervous breakdown. And so mom said, well, I guess I, so I quit school. And I mean, the good story is though, I went back, I got my academic upgrading. I went on to university, got my um, bachelor's of biblical studies and I'm, we're now trying to work towards a uh, master's. And so, I mean, yes, I, I always worry. Like I asked, I told one person, do I share that? I had to quit school when I'm talking to teens. But that's part of the story. That's part of our story. And that's, it's part of what God can make beautiful. And he has, he, by his grace and by his, his sustaining power, he's gotten me through all that from the past, seen me through school again, and seen me through university, and is seeing me through this next stage of my life. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you got to tell that story. Sometimes we're worried about our stories because we're wondering what people might think, but that's exactly why God's given us that story, to share that to people. And like I say, make it personal. That's, that's the thing. When you're, we, like, like, we're not all theologians. None of us are, really. None of us need to be. But we all sometimes worry we've got to have the right, per- the right perfect thing to say. We've got to have the, well, what's the theological construct of today? What, we need to use that to make sure we talk right, talk right about the Bible. But no, that's not what God wants. God wants us just to say, hey, I've given you a story. I've brought you through deep waters. I've brought you through the mountains. I've brought you through the valleys. Speak that into somebody's life because that's what God wants. God wants us just to be personal. I mean, sometimes it's scary to open up your heart. Sometimes it's scary to stand up here and say, hey, look, I've gone through some stuff. I've gone through some really heavy stuff. But I mean, like I, like I say, I mean, again, personal, I'll, I'll tell you. But after mom died, I wasn't quite a Christian. I went through a really bad time. I was in the hospital thinking I was dying of something. I don't know what it was. And two people came and spoke Christ into my life. I accepted Jesus in the hospital bed. But afterwards, I went into a deep, deep depression. And I was. And I was, I was at a one point committing suicide. But then again, what did God do? God brought an amazing angel of light into my life as a counselor, a Christian counselor at our church. And she talked me down. She, she shared into my life the things of God. and what. So again, we don't need to be afraid of our story. We need to speak our stories. And never be afraid of the story you've been given because it's going to touch somebody else's life for a meaningful and great way. So don't be afraid of your story. But... Is anything with God, anything of what God's commands are, sometimes we don't, I don't, I'll speak for myself. I'm not going to speak for everybody. Sometimes we just don't do what God's telling us to do. We either, it, whether, whether it be that, hey, go talk, like Mark was saying, you know, you got $6 in your pocket, give it to that person. Sometimes we have those feelings. We have that, I should go talk to this person, or I should give this to this person, or I should do this or do that. But what do we do a lot of times? We say, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. I, you know, I can't, ugh, what? What are they going to think? What are they going to do? Why? Ugh, I just, no, I can't do it. And you know what I think personally the biggest reason why we never do that stuff is because we're afraid. We are afraid to do that. We are afraid to speak into that life. We're afraid to, to give because like we might be embarrassed how they're going to react, how they're going to think, how they're going to feel. But we, do, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid. I mean, if you look at I'm going to quote this because I don't want to get it wrong. I, I, I was doing my, some research, and it's really cool what I found. Do you realize how many times the word fear and some kind of concept of do not be afraid is mentioned in the Bible? And again, I'm going to totally read this. So I don't want to mess it up. In my research, I came across this. It says, the number of times the phrase fear not is used in context differs between translations of the Bible. We all know that. Some of you read the King James Version. Some of you read NIV. Some of you read whatever. But the different translations, but there's a concept of fear not. The King James Version, for instance, uses the phrase 74 times. And the New American Standard Bible uses the phrase four times. So you see there's quite a difference. But other phrases with meaning similar to fear not are also present in the Bible. The King James Version includes 29 incidences of the phrase be not afraid. The New American Standard includes the phrases do not fear 57 times. And also do not be afraid 46 times. And there also, there's a theory out there too that, and some people debate it, but I, I, I see why not, de- why debate it. But there's also the theory there that there is 300, get this, this is where it gets cool, 365 versions of do not be afraid. I didn't do the research because it would took forever, but what I'm saying is there's somebody that did that. So think about it, 365 days a year. There's a fear not for 365 days of the year. Pretty cool, I mean, that's pretty weird, but it's pretty cool. So again, why do we need to be afraid? The, God, the Bible's telling us, 
basically each day of the year we could, do, we could read one that don't be afraid. <laughs> but for some reason we are. But again, the Bible, there's so many examples. I'll just throw a few out to you right now. Fear not, for I am with you, Isaiah 41.10 says. Deuteronomy 3.22 says, You shall not fear, for it is your Lord, your God, who fights for you. He's fighting for us. Be strong and courageous, do not fear, or be in dread of them, for it is your Lord, your God, who goes with you. He goes with us. He fights for us. He goes with us. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. That's found in Deuteronomy 31.6. In Psalm 118.6 says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? He's by our side. He is right there fighting with us along our side. Why be afraid? Another one is Matthew 10.31 says, Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. I mean, God values us. God sees us as important. So why be afraid? And also in Luke 12.32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love the words that the Bible uses, like little flock. What an endearing term that is, little flock. Like it just, to me, I just picture little fuzzy little lambs and just, you know, just God picking you up and giving you a great big hug. It just warms your heart in a really silly Hallmark card kind of way, but it's kind of cool. So I, I, I think it's great and God uses those words. Like you say, I'll never, not one word is for not. It's for a purpose. And again, it speaks to each of us differently, but that's how that one speaks to me. And and I, I, I love Christmas. I love Christmas. I start my countdown at 100. I'm on the countdown. People on Facebook are hating me right now, but I don't care. We're 53 days away, in case you're wondering. Or 52 sleeps. It's all good. 52 sleeps. But anyway, the coolest story about this, and the reason why I say this is, I was thinking about it, but the shepherds. It, it, it's such a great story because it talks about this. It talks about, it has the fear not thing, and it also has a salt and, salt and, salt and light. Because the angels appeared to those little shepherds. I'm not going to read it because that's going to be read at Christmas time, so I won't bother. But what it basically was, was these angels came to these shepherds and said, Fear not, for behold, I give you great joys, of, a tidings of great joys for be for all people. And they, he, they spoke into these poor shepherds, these lowly shepherds, again, the lowly, the meek, the people that probably think they're ostracized from society. They weren't looked upon as being great. But God sent a multitude of angels to speak into their lives and say, Fear not. And then what did they do? Did they say, whoa, that was freaky. I'm not sharing that with anybody. No, no. What did they do? They ran to the city to see what God has talked about, to see what God has given to them. And then what did they do after that? They didn't say, well, that was cool. We saw it anyway. That's cool. Let's go home. Let's go back to our field. No, they went out into the world and told people of the story. They told people of the great things they've seen, the story that was given to them. So again, Christmas is a great time of year, and I'm getting excited, and I'll stop. But anyway, <clears throat> so we are to be light, that pen, salt and light like they did. They went out, they saw, they, they conquered, they, they were just lit, lit on fire. And that's the kind of fire that God's looking from us today. He wants us to just to be that, that salt and that light and that just, uh, just to be, you know, he wants us to just go and, and speak into that and not be afraid. And I will, I'm, I will leave you with a great, one of the most coolest, I, I, I use cool and awesome a lot and maybe that's not preacher speak but i use it a lot so if i ever get a chance to do this again i'm going to use it again <laughs> but so one of the coolest verses i've i one of my coolest favorite verses i've ever read is this and it applies to what i was saying today and i'll read you i'll close with this verse and then i'll pray but it says and it's found in isaiah 6 60 verses 1 through 3 isaiah 60 chapter 60 verses 1 through 3 <clears throat> and it reads the subtitle on mine is The Future Glory of Israel. And it reads, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness its people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light, and kings of the, to the brightness of your rising. Like, people will come to our lights. Even kings will come to our brightness. And we've seen that in, again, the Christmas story. Kings came to that little light that was shining in Bethlehem. So shine your light, people. Let it shine. Don't be ashamed of your light. Just let it burst forth. And again, be that salt. Throw it out there. Be tasty. Just show people that God is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what he wants from us today. He wants us to be that to people's lives. He wants us to be both salt and light. So I thank you for indulging me, and let's close in prayer. 
or I'll pray and then Pastor Mark will close the service.